As an example, we're going to look at a sand dune in the Sahara Desert. You know, even if you have never been to the Sahara Desert, I'm sure you have seen those pictures of the beautiful sand dunes, right? These are basically sand that's, sculpt, that's sculpted by the shifting wind, and uh, they form this dune-shaped structure. If you take a closer look, you find these sand dunes are similarly shaped, and that is this angle of inclination is not that far from one another. And have you ever seen a sand dune that's shaped like this? Okay, so what is wrong with this? Well, obviously, it's too steep. So if a grain of sand sits here, it's going to drop by itself. It's going to, it's going to slide by itself. It, the angle is too steep. Okay, so what happens is that if something like that forms temporarily, then the sand is going to slide and slide and slide. The angle will become less steep until at some point, angle is such that it's going to stop sliding. Okay, this is called a critical angle. Theta critical. What is going on here? Well, at this point, the sand is not sliding down anymore, which means the, there is a static friction upward, which is now enough to hold off against the gravitational component pulling it down. Okay, let's look at how we find this critical angle. Say there is a box resting on an incline. Okay, I want to know how can I increase this angle such that the box will stay put, it will not slide down? What is the greatest possible value of this angle such that when I raise the, uh, the incline to this angle, the box still stays put, but a little bit above that angle, it's going to start sliding. Okay, that's why it's called a critical angle. Now, to do so, we first identify our system, which is the box, or a grain of sand, same thing. And then let me draw a free body diagram, right? Let me draw a free body diagram. So you have this, mg, and you have n. What else do we have? Well, since the box is not moving, there must be an upward force along the incline to hold it off. So there must be a friction force, and that's static because it's, no, it's not moving. Okay, uh, next question is, how do I choose a coordinate system? Well, in this case, um, remember we chose Downward, uh, along the incline, perpendicular incline. You can still do that, sure. But in this case, it doesn't really make that much of a difference, even if you choose horizontally and vertically. You'll get an answer which is similarly, you know, easy. And why is that? Because being, you know, drawing something along the incline is not necessarily, you know, the only good choice. It was the best choice for our previous problem because the thing actually moved along the incline. It accelerated downwards, remember? Okay, in our case, the thing is not moving at all, which means the net acceleration, uh, the net force along any direction must be zero because there is no acceleration along any direction. So, the geometrical constraint is so simple, it's just simply A equal to zero along any axis, no matter how you choose it. So, you see, you can do it any way you want. You can choose any axis you want. But let's still, uh, let's let's say we still prefer this way, okay? X and Y. You can choose horizontal and vertical and see what happens. Should be also pretty simple. This angle is theta. Now let's see. In the X direction, what do I have this time? Well, I have mg sine theta as usual. But I also have an fs against it, right? Fs. And that is equal to m times a sub x, which is zero because it doesn't move in the x direction. Okay, in the y direction, I have n going up, and I have mg cosine theta, that's mg cosine theta going down. So n minus mg cosine theta equals zero. Okay, this equation is valid at any angle of inclination up, up to the critical angle. In fact, as I raise this thing here, I find that mg sin theta goes up, right, because theta goes up, which means fs has to pick up accordingly to cancel with mg sin theta. But at the critical angle, you find that mg sin theta is so large that the that force of static friction has already reached its maximum value. It cannot go any higher than that. So if you raise it any higher, sliding becomes inevitable. So at the critical angle, okay, at theta equals theta critical, 
fs equals its maximum value. Okay, please remember, it does not always equal its maximum value, but it does so when the theta value, the, the angle of theta reaches the critical value theta c. Okay, now, the nice thing is, I know what the critical value, uh, I know what the theta fs maximum is. Okay, fs maximum equals mu s times n, right? Mu s times n, we just learned that. So, what you do then is to plug in theta equals theta c and fs equals fs maximum, which is mu s times n, into this equation. Let's see what we get. So that fixes fs. So I have now mg sine theta critical minus fs maximum, which is right here, mu s n, that equals 0. And the second equation is, uh, is uh, n equals mg cosine critical, theta critical. Okay, plug that n in, and you immediately find an equation for, 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 for theta critical. So I have mg sine theta critical minus mu s n, which is right here, mg cosine theta critical equals 0. And you cross on mg, what do you get? You get sine theta minus g cosine theta equals 0, and therefore you say you find the tangent theta critical equals mu s. That is how we find the critical angle. Okay, so for example, if the if mu s equals 1, by the way, that's a very, it's not just a simple number, but it's a very important special case. You can check the table in, in chapter 5 for uh, some coefficients of static friction, you find that for rubber on dry concrete, which is basically for driving condition, right? You know, tires are made of rubber, and you, you suppose you, 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 know, you drive on dry concrete, mu s equals about equal to 1. Okay, so that is a very important number. So when mu s equals equal to 1, what's the critical angle? 45 degrees, right? Because tangent 45 degrees equals 1. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us if you want to park a car on a sloping street. What is the greatest possible angle of inclination you can park your car without the car sliding back down by itself? 45 degrees. Okay, that is the best you can do. You cannot park a car on a, on a curve steeper than that. As a matter of fact, 45 degrees would make it very dangerous. So, you know, no safe street should have an in angle of inclination close to 45 degrees. If you go to the streets of San Francisco, you find some very steep st streets. They look very, very much inclined, but I can tell you, none of them is close to 45 degrees. Otherwise, it's too dangerous to drive. Okay, so if you have a very steep street, uh, you know, suppose you do, do have a very steep slope like this. It's difficult. It's, in fact, impossible to go up like this or go down like this. There is not enough friction. So what you do instead is you build winding roads like this. You, know, you build one new roads. So you, you curve up like this. So at every segment, you're not going at that steep angle. You, you have to cover greater distance, but you can go up and down safely. You see streets like that in places like San Francisco. Okay. Our next example involves two objects. One on an incline, the other is suspended vertically. And these two are connected by a cable so that they have the same acceleration. I label them object one and two. So that's a case of uh, two objects with the same acceleration. And immediately you know when you want to study their motion, you have the option of separating them into separate systems or combining them into the same system. And you, learn, you know the pros and cons for, for either one. Suppose I give, I, I'm given the mass M1 and M2. Okay, I, get, I, get, I also know the angle of inclination. What I want to know is, what is the acceleration of each of them? Assuming that there is no friction first. And we can add friction later, assuming there is no friction here. Okay, how do we do it? Well, again, you can separate them or you can combine them. The advantage of combining them is that it eliminates all the internal forces. What is an internal force that we want to get rid of? Well, how about the tension in the cable, right? Uh, that's from object one to object two, right? Object two is pulling the cable 
So that's also pulling object one. And si similarly, object one is pulling on cable also with the same exact amount of force and is pulling on object two. That force of tension is an internal force. You know, so if I want it, I can combine these two into the same system. Therefore, I'm going, I'm going to eliminate that tension because it's internal. What about the external forces? Well, uh, for object two, obviously, we have a force downwards. That's M2G. That is external. Let me uh, draw it. And then you have tension, but that's internal. I don't care anymore. Right? In fact, this tension and this tension, they just cancel each other out because it's internal. Now, looking at M1, I find that there is a normal force N1 going down, going up like, like this, and there is M1G like this. That's it. Okay, there is no friction yet. This angle is theta. Now, N1 is going to cancel with a component of M M1G. In fact, N1 equals MG, M1G cosine theta because it doesn't move. Uh, object 1 doesn't move perpendicularly inclined. But I don't really care. What I care about is the acceleration of both of them. For M1, it's just up and down inclined. Therefore, I don't care about you know, the direction perpendicular to it. So as far as direction parallel to the incline, the net force, on uh, the, 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 the only external force, that is, on M1, uh, on M1 would be M1G sine theta. That's that component. This tension T is, is external. I mean, I'm sorry, it's internal because I combined with object 2. Okay, so the next question is how do I find the acceleration? You see, I don't even know whether the thing slides up the incline or whether it slides down the incline. That all depends on how heavy object 2 is relative to object 1. I don't really know. So, what do I do? Well, not to worry. We can make an assumption as to the direction of motion, and all we have to do is be self-consistent. And then we can find the acceleration according to our assumption of positive direction. And if it turns out the acceleration is positive, that means our assumption is correct. Otherwise, our assumption is wrong. The action moves, accelerates in the opposite direction. Okay, so let us assume, for example, that it accelerates this way. Okay, so M2 is heavy enough so that this thing goes downwards. So, if that is the case, we know object 1 will have to slide upward, not downward, right? So, if we did so, then what is the external force that promotes this acceleration downward? That would be M2G, right? That would be M2G. And then what about M1G? Well, M1G has a component that, that's against that acceleration, which is M1G sine theta. So, M1G sine theta. That's negative. Okay, so M M2G want to pull it this way, M1G sine theta want to pull it that way. That is the net force, which provides the acceleration for both of them. So for both of them, don't forget, I must add their masses up. Okay, M1 plus M2G. No. That tells you what the acceleration is. I'm sorry, this is A, not G. Okay, I, I need to find A, right? So A equals M2G minus M1G sine theta over M1 plus M2. So I have A equals uh, M1 minus M2 sine theta over M1 plus M2 times G. Now, did we make the right guess? Is it true that the, the system is, is going to slide this way? Well. That depends on whether A is positive or negative. If A is positive, that means our choice of positive direction is actually correct. And that happens when M1 is greater than M2 sine theta. Okay? I'm sorry, M2. What am I doing here? M2 here and M1. That happens when M2 is greater than M1 sine theta. Right? Then A is positive that the whole thing will slide this way. So the minimum value of the mass for M2 that can make it happen is M1 sine theta. On the other hand, if M1 sine theta is greater than M2 and A will be negative, so the actual acceleration is down the slope, and for M2 it's going to accelerate upwards. And if M2 equals M1 sine theta exactly, then there is no acceleration for the system, so they are either going to stay put or they're going to move up and down without any acceleration. 
Okay, so this is what happens when you have these two objects and no friction. So, what happens when I add some friction? Well, then the situation is a little bit more complicated because that really depends on how much mass M2 has. If M2 is really heavy enough, then despite the friction here, it's just, the whole thing is still going to move forward, move upward with, with an acceleration. Okay, and the friction, of course, is down the slope because it's against the tendency of motion, which is upward. On the other hand, it is also possible that M1 is large enough so that this thing is going to accelerate downwards. And if that is the case, the, the friction is actually reversed, right? The friction is against the tendency of motion, so the friction this time is upward. So, we have to look at both possibilities. Okay, so possibility number one is when M2 is really large so that the acceleration of the of the of the first object is up the slope okay so then what i have for m for m1 would be like this okay for m1 would be like this i would have m1g i would have n1 and remember it it wants to go upward it's actually going upward and therefore the tendency uh, th therefore, the friction being against it is like this, okay, Fk. And that, of course, is mu qua n, right? This angle is theta. So, the difference is now we have an additional force which retards the motion, which, which, which is against the acceleration, and that force is Fk, which is mu qua n. What is n? Actually, it's n1. And what is n1 equal to? n1 cancels with a component of gravity perpendicular to the incline. n1 must still be equal to m1. n1 must still be equal to m1g cosine theta. Because after all, the object cannot move perpendicular to the incline. Okay. So this is a uh, mu k m1g cosine theta. So the net force would be m2g minus m1g sine theta, now we, we got these two forces before, but minus a new term, this one, okay, minus mu k m1 g cosine theta, that is the net force that gives the acceleration m1 plus m2. A. Okay, so that is the case when m2 is really large so that the acceleration of the first uh, of, 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 of object one is actually up the slope despite the resistance of friction now we have to be self-consistent okay we have to be self-consistent and that is when we solve a we want to check whether a is positive or negative it has to be positive because we assumed that it goes upward so friction is downward so that you, you got to you got to find this side to see whether it's positive or negative Okay, that of course requires that m2 minus m1 sine theta minus m1 mu k cosine theta be greater than zero. Okay, be greater or equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, it still can go upward but without any acceleration. This is the minimum value of m2 that can make this scenario happen. We can also go backwards, okay? We can also go backwards uh, when n1, okay? If m1 is really large, then the thing is gonna slide backwards. The difference now is not only is the acceleration reversed, but also the static friction is reversed. So let me choose this as the positive direction now, okay? This is the positive direction. So I have m1 g sine theta minus mu k m1 g cosine theta why minus because friction is always against the tendency of motion okay it's up it's up the slope now actually down the slope is positive and what about m2 g well i'm going uh, it's going this way which is positive then m2 of course is against that m2 g is against it so m2 g now becomes negative so minus m2 g this becomes equal to m1 plus m2a 
Okay, is this the correct scenario? Well, if it is correct, then this side must be positive or at worst zero because otherwise we made a wrong assumption. Otherwise, the accident would be negative and the thing actually goes up the slope. But if it's up the slope, you don't have this negative sign here. Okay, if it's up the slope, then these two terms would have the same sign, right? Because friction would be down the slope. So, the condition for that to be valid is this side must be, cannot be negative. So, we have m1 sine theta minus mu k m1 cosine theta minus m2 must be greater or equal to zero. Okay, now you notice these two conditions are not quite the same. They, they don't just differ by a negative sign. Because look, you got these two terms with the same sign, but those two terms now have opposite signs, one positive, one negative. So be careful about that. And, and, and the reason why this happens is because friction can reverse its direction. Okay, you know, static friction can vary both in magnitude and in direction. It can go up to a maximum value. Kinetic friction is a little simpler. It does not change magnitude. It's always equal to mu k times n, as long as n is fixed. But it can still change its direction depending on the actual direction motion. It is always against the actual direction of motion.